Of all the leaders whose lives are described in the Bible, Solomon, King Solomon, reflects our times and our problems most exactly. He ruled a nation whose wealth and society were the envy of the world at the time. He ruled a nation that historically had called upon God as their Lord. His position as king was unchallenged by his own people, nor was it threatened by any other king. And he reigned at a time of unprecedented peace and prosperity in the land in comparison to other nations. And yet, with all of these advantages, there were serious problems that plagued him and the nation that he ruled. The people were burdened with excessive taxes to maintain a wealthy court. Solomon himself had a large harem of foreign wives who eventually led him into idolatry. The nation itself began to drift away from the worship of God into idolatrous practices. And political battle was brewing because Solomon had not prepared a successor. And this threatened the stability of the nation and opened it to attack from other kings. Because of these problems, Solomon's kingdom eventually split into two parts and the nation of Israel never again regained its former glory. The fall of this great nation and its king can serve as a very good lesson to our nation during these times, especially during these times when we have begun to talk a lot about elections and selecting a president. And so his life and his times can serve us as a good lesson because we are in a similar position and we face similar problems almost 3,000 years later. So this morning I'd like to review Solomon's fall and some of the advice that he, if he were alive today, might give to America as a result of his experiences. That's why the sermon is entitled Solomon's Advice to America. Now, when we look at Solomon's demise, it's tempting to speculate that he simply fell victim to worldly success. You know, he, 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 he let things slip because he was so rich or he began to forget the basics because he was too busy enjoying himself or perhaps he got too big for his britches, you know, as the old saying says. But Solomon's fall was not simply a matter of carelessness in obeying God. Not simply the general disobedience of one who begins to slack off spiritually. No, Solomon fell because he disobeyed three very specific commands that God gave to those who would become rulers over his people. And these rules are found in Deuteronomy chapter 17 and I'll read from that passage in a moment. Now the book of Deuteronomy is a review of all the precepts and commands that Moses gave the people while they were in the desert. Moses at this time was at the end of his life and the people were on the verge of entering into the promised land. And so in Deuteronomy, Moses reviews what the people must and must not do as they go forward into the land of Canaan. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 to 20, Moses prophesies that they will one day have a king, and when they do, their king will need to abide by some basic rules of conduct. And so fast forward several hundred years later, Solomon becomes the third king to rule Israel. And he kept only a few of these commands, and for this reason, set into motion the failure of his kingdom. So let's look at the commands that Moses gave and review how well Solomon followed them. First of all, there were some that Solomon actually managed to abide by. So let's go to chapter 17 in Deuteronomy and read verse 14. When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you and you possess it and live in it, and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations who are around me, 
You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your countrymen you shall set as king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not your countryman. And so the first thing that Solomon obeyed was he let God choose the king. Solomon was chosen by God and he humbled himself at the beginning by asking God for wisdom instead of for power and wealth. And God richly blessed him with all of the wisdom of the world in addition to power and wealth at the beginning of his reign. The second thing he obeyed was that he never returned to Egypt. He never mounted a campaign to return back to Egypt. Verse 16, it says, moreover, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor shall he cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never again return that way. Now we know that Solomon had uh, certain alliances, military and political alliances with Egypt, but he never mounted any attempt to return to the land of his nation's former slavery, uh, which is Egypt. On the contrary, for a time, Israel was greater and more powerful than Egypt. But now we get into verses 17 to 20 of this passage, and we begin reading the commands that Solomon did not follow, and the actions that set his downfall into motion. And we read in verse 17a, it says, He shall not multiply wives for himself, or else his heart will turn away. So Moses says to the future king not to multiply wives, and what will happen if he does? And so what happens? Solomon has an abundance of foreign wives, a thousand of them in his harem. Now in those days, kings would contract all kinds of political marriages in order to strengthen their position and create alliances. In addition to this, the abundance of wives would provide for a, you know, a larger royal household and guarantee the succession you know, of, the, of, of the throne, succession of the family. In Israel, however, the safety of the nation depended on God, not military or political alliances. Succession was not a matter of progeny, it was a matter of promise. If God promised that your children would sit on the throne, then He would make it happen no matter how many or few children that you had. And so when trouble came for Solomon, neither his alliances nor the number of children could maintain peace in the land and unity in succession. Solomon's children fought each other for possession and his allies quickly tried to dominate what they thought to be a weakened position and a weakened kingdom. The greatest trap of these foreign wives, however, was their influence in uh, turning and drawing him away from the worship of the true and living God. Just as Moses had said, they turned his heart away from the Lord and slowly led him into pagan worship practices. It was this sin that lost for him the protection and blessings of God and led to the ruin of the nation. And then we continue in verse 17b, something else that he did that he was warned not to do. It says, you shall not multiply wives for himself or else his heart will turn away, nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself. Solomon taxed heavily. He placed a heavy burden on the people. Solomon and his court were fabulously rich for several reasons. First of all, his father David amassed great wealth before him, and the country itself was prosperous in its exports, and it also received a large wealth because of Solomon's wisdom and consultation to other nations, and of course, heavy taxes on the people. It was the issue of crushing taxes while the nation was at peace and enjoying prosperity. That was the last straw. And so when his son succeeded him on the throne and added even more taxes, the people revolted and this caused the nation to divide. God had warned not to selfishly amass wealth as king, but Solomon ignored this to his detriment. And then in the following verses, we find the third thing 
that led to Solomon's downfall. Beginning in verse 18 it says, Now it shall come about when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. It shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by carefully observing all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted up above his countrymen and that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left so that he and his sons may continue long in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. The third thing he disobeyed he neglected God's word. You see, in pagan nations, the king was God. But in Israel, God was the king, and the king was his servant. Moses said that the king's role was to rule the people in light of God's word. In order to do this, he had to carefully study the word himself each day and teach his own children so they would always rule according to God's commands. Solomon and his children abandoned the word and this caused them to serve other gods and indulge themselves in worldliness. You know, we read in the book of Ecclesiastes that near the end of his life, Solomon came back to the Lord and acknowledged what was right and what he should have done all along. This may have brought him some peace and personal salvation, but it was too late for the nation that a scant few centuries later would, except for a small group in exile, be totally destroyed, its greatness gone forever. Now if anyone could provide advice for our nation and its potential leaders at this time in history, it would certainly be Solomon who saw it all and did it all as king. I believe that based on his own experience, this is what Solomon would say to America. First of all, he would say, restore moral excellence as a requirement for our nation's leaders. Number one. You know, the sex scandal involving former President Clinton, that was a long time ago, but many of us remember that. That episode showed how damaging to our culture and nation that low morals can be in a national leader. I ask you, have our moral standards gone up or down since that event? And I think you know the answer. The great danger in that matter was not that a president might have been impeached, but rather that the nation come to ignore or excuse such conduct from one who had such grave responsibilities. You cannot detach moral responsibility from political responsibility. They are two parts of the very same unit. Sexual purity, faithfulness to marriage vows, respect for human life, commitment to high moral values are all necessary ingredients for leadership. Because if we don't insist on these things at the top, it won't be long before we will not insist on these things at the bottom either. Virtue is what guarantees liberty, not government. Our leaders need to embody what is godly, what is best, what is excellent, what is truest about our nation if we are to maintain our values and our way of life and our freedoms. I'll give you an equation. Less virtue plus more laws and government equals less personal freedom. Neither adulterers or homosexuals or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Paul says that very clearly in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Whether they be leaders or the nation that follows their example. Restore moral excellence at the top. Another piece of advice for America from Solomon. Restore fiscal moderation. Numerous wives are what drew Solomon away from the Lord to paganism, but it was his excessive taxes that divided the nation. You know, I heard someone make a wise analogy on a radio program once. He said, what is good financial policy for a family is good financial policy for a nation of families. Abraham Lincoln also said the very same kinds of things when he spoke about money matters and the nation. And I quote, he said, you cannot bring about prosperity by discouraging thrift. 
He said, you cannot establish security on borrowed money. Simple ideas that help ordinary families deal with their budget should be applied to the leaders thinking about money as well. For example, don't spend what you don't have. Or keep some money for a rainy day. Or pay off your debts before you splurge on new purchases. Isn't that the type of thing that we try to teach our children and our teenagers and our young people before they set out to start their own families? Solomon and his sons learned the hard way that freedom and national prosperity are meaningless if they don't permit the individual to keep the majority of what he's earned. And so restore moral excellence. Practice fiscal moderation. And thirdly, restore God as the Lord of this nation. You know, God could keep Solomon through his tax and diplomacy errors, but when Solomon abandoned God, there was no help for him in this matter. It's no secret that America is fast becoming a secular state as unbelievers have infiltrated and pressured government to detach itself from any acknowledgement or dependence or subjection to God, the Creator, and His Son, Jesus Christ. Of course, this flies in the face of not only the word of God, which says that all governments are established for and by God, Romans 13, 1, who said that we are going to be the exception? You know, separation of God and state, that's a human idea, that's not a godly idea. It also contradicts the belief of the original founding fathers and leaders of this nation. I mean, George Washington said, and I quote, True religion affords government its surest support. It is impossible to govern the world without God and the Bible." End quote. And yet, as the U.S. occupies the role of the only superpower in the world today, this is exactly what it's trying to do, rule the world without God. What a disaster awaits us if we succeed. Without God as Lord of this nation, without a fixed moral code set by the Bible, even Taliban extremists could beat us. We, we, are, we are thinking about what happened 20 years ago, and we think about 9-11, exactly how many people brought this nation to its knees in one day? 11, 12, 20? You don't think God could allow an evil-minded person to do that again? Billions in war costs and security and change travel and threat levels in our economy. Do you realize how much money we've actually spent in the last 15 years protecting ourselves against a threat that happened to us 15 years ago that we don't want to repeat? Do you know how much money has been spent, caused by 20 guys. We need to restore America as a Christian country as it was originally founded to be. Of course, I understand, I get it. Laws are there to protect the freedom of every religion. Yes, that's the price of a democratic system in a modern society. However, if we don't protect and promote our own Christian heritage, the one that actually began and made this country great, we will lose it. And we will also lose the greatness that it produced. Brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of something historical. It was not Hinduism or Islam or Buddhism or Judaism that laid the spiritual foundation of America. It was Christianity that did that. You know, we need to support those who will promote Christian values and objectives in this country, and here's my point, and do so without apology. I do not apologize for voting for a man or a woman who espouses my values in Christ. I don't have to apologize to anybody for that. After all, those who practice Islam or other religions in this country do so freely and without making excuses for their zeal. Nobody knocks the Muslims for their zeal, for their faith. Why should I be ashamed for having zealous thoughts about Christianity? 
You know, it's interesting to note that America is the only civilized nation in the world that does not protect its religious heritage. We actually pass laws to undermine our faith and we, use, and we work overtime to protect the rights of atheists and non-Christians who are in the business of replacing Christ as Lord with their worthless philosophies and pagan religions. We help those people along. We push them along. We protect their rights. But we allow unscrupulous leaders and politicians to undermine our rights. And the religion that founded this country. I don't know where the cutoff point is. I really don't. I'm no prophet. You know where God is no longer the Lord of this nation? I, I don't know what insult, what blasphemy, what policy, what degree of sin, what percentage of non-Christian population will finally disengage us from this divine relationship and the protection and the blessings it affords. I don't know when God the Lord will finally consider our cup of sins full to the brim and punish us, discipline us in order to save us from ourselves. I simply know two things. First, this is the direction that we are heading into. And secondly, I do not want to be around when it happens. I think it's about the only good thing about getting older. I'm getting closer to the time when I'm out of here. Solomon's lapse of faith plunged his people into, in, into an irreversible fall into immorality and idolatry and in the end political disaster. Does this sound familiar? I'm sure that if Solomon were here, he would, he would have more to say to our leaders on many topics, but I think these three are a good starting point. Like me, you might feel rather helpless at times when you realize what's happening on the larger sta uh, stage of life and there doesn't seem to be much you can do about it. I don't know about you, but I'm watching the news and I, I used to just comment about what the guy was saying, you know, to leave, oh look at this, look at, now I'm yelling at the guy. <laughs> it might surprise you to know, however, that even great leaders felt like this at times. And like you and me, they chose the only recourse that they had when the problem was too great and they seemed too small. And that recourse was prayer. On April the 30th, 1863, Abraham Lincoln, discouraged by the state of the nation over which he ruled, went to the Lord with the following prayer which he recorded, and I read it for you. He said, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in members and wealth and power as no other nation has ever grown, but we have forgotten God. He goes on to say, we have forgotten the gracious hand that has preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us and we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace too, too, too proud to pray to God, the God that made us. And then he finishes, it behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. Close quotation marks. Oh, to have leaders today who would pray this prayer. Oh, to have a nation today that would humble itself before such wisdom, a wisdom that even eluded Solomon for much of his life. Oh, to have leaders elected who would seek God's blessing and counsel before accepting the challenge of leading this great nation. And oh, 
what rejoicing there would be in heaven today even if one soul called out to God for forgiveness and restoration in Jesus' name, let alone an entire nation. You know, the church, the church exercises no great political power here, even in our own community. You know, we can't make or break a candidate. However, we do have great spiritual power in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because this ministry gives us the power to convict, the power to forgive, the power to restore, the power to comfort and intercede, the power to include. And so in the future, brothers and sisters, I, I encourage you to choose and to vote for candidates, whatever party, never mind that, to choose and vote for candidates that will honor God in their conduct and work on behalf of the people regardless of the party because your vote will affect the course of this nation for the next, the next few years. And I also encourage you to choose to obey Jesus Christ today because every day is voting day for the belief in Jesus Christ that decision will affect your life forever. And so if you need to come to Christ this day and join those who confess His name and await His return, then I do encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.